Oh, oh, you look pretty good. Yeah. Okay, all right, I guess so. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Everything is on. Okay, let's just, I usually just give five minutes. Uh, whoever is here is here. Whoever is not, um, then we just start talking and recording. The recording is already happening. So welcome before anything else to everyone that is listening to us. Uh, this is about this guy right here. Me, me, <laughs> Joseph Leonardi, yes. Mr. Joseph Leonardi, yeah, I thought uh, this is the first time in a matter of fact that we are doing it in this way. He kidnapped me and he wanted me to be here anyway, but uh, it is it can be a fun way to do it, guys, for next times. Uh, to remind you also that this coming Friday, we're also having another interview with Andrea D. Lang, and she can correct you about the pronunciation of the last name. But we're trying more and more, besides interviewing scientists and doctors and uh, news people and everything like that, to keep having uh, the, this is my story. Because every time that I hear a story of someone really joining the group, still I'm always amazed of what everybody has gone through. And I never get tired of this. So, um, it is really amazing about the strengths and empower of people. So um, while this is happening, because we're gonna wait the five minutes to to start to see if um, you know when people enter or things like that. Um, don't you? And uh, I, I will be in charge of admitting people. That's no problem. Uh, why don't you start? Honestly, um, uh, people, you know, really about what's going on lately about uh, the very successful uh, film because I was super, super, super happy and excited when I saw it. So, hello, Andrea. How are you? Hello, Douglas. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, guys. So, uh, we're just going to give it about five more minutes, but while that happened, um, he's just going to um, tell us a little bit about this really successful uh, film that he just had and I was lucky to to be there so what I, I mean like honestly okay. to tell you the truth I, I didn't even know and about the name of the title this old tea, old room. tea room right and, and so, so can you tell us what, what yes. I mean I mean I cannot yes, get it sure but... so so a, a tea room was uh before the age of like you know manhunt and you know, grinder and all of that. It, it was it was a term for public restrooms where gay men would meet to have sex. And I, I actually I went to John Waters uh, reading for or yeah. his or his little thing, and he said, "Oh, they're these young kids aren't going to know what a glor uh, what a, what a tea room is." Yeah. And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, but they know, but everybody knows what a glory hole is." <laughs> <laughs> straight kids everybody you know so anyway so um the the film this old tea room is a comedy uh, about an aging gay tv host and his crew racing an episode on glory hole cozies <clears throat> and so they're putting together this this like tv pilot and uh and through the the process it kind of spins the host off into this um kind of showdown with his own shifting <clears throat> uh, ideas about sex and love as he ages. So it's really about aging in the LGBT community. But um, but so years and how this came to me is years ago, I was in a rehearsal and this really wonderful persnickety queen was knitting. And I said, what are you knitting? And he was knitting a coat. Everybody needs. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> todo, todo mundo teje. Mi mamá también teje. Everybody needs. Okay. So I asked this guy, what are you knitting? And he said, oh, I'm knitting a cozy for my TV remote control. And I just thought, how do you get any more fabulously gay than that? <laughs> well, glory hole cozies. So, and that's, that's how the idea was kind of born. And then I just 
hadn't really done anything with it for a while because I didn't know what I wanted to say with it. It was kind of during a little <laughs> bit of the pandemic. Um, well, I thought it was a funny idea and I didn't want to just waste it on it. Well, but what I wanted to say is really at the end, honestly, uh, I, I thought it was a very successful idea. I mean, I was laughing a lot and, and, and you know, the writing, the acting, he's one of the main actors. It was superb. Um, also, uh, in having Andrea here, Andrea, I really wish that you were like this with me <laughs> in our interview, but we're going to be in a little bit different format. And for to have this recording also, once again, uh, we will have the recording of this as well. So just to remind you uh, that Andrea will be uh, it, it, with us this coming Friday for whoever sees the recording or arrives here. Uh, you know, it will be, I'm really looking forward to my interaction with Andrea and, um, and seeing things. So let's just start, you know, and whoever else just show up, I'll be in charge of this. Just let people in. Also, this kind of show you a little bit of what I've been doing again. I was, I was telling Joseph, uh, before that, uh, you know, I have interviewed directors of magazines. I have interviewed... Uh, by now scientists, I have interviewed all kinds of people. But at the end, it is very, very important to don't forget my story, your story, our story. And um, and when Joseph and I, we were talking, I was like, yeah, of course, we're going to talk about the play. But, but I want people to get to know Joseph. Um, I'm lucky to, um, to know Joseph for... 20 years, about so, 20, over 20 years. So for about yeah. 20 years. Yeah. But do you remember when we met the first night? I we... do remember where we met, but yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's trying to direct the interview oh, now. I'm just asking for okay, all right, all right. But uh, uh, I, I want to start with something that for me, it has been also a driving force because it is very interesting how sometimes the place that we're born, uh, it really motivates uh, everything that we create, but also uh, in this case, our story uh, with HIV. So where are you from, Mr. Joseph Leonardo? I'm from the uh, thriving metropolis of Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, yeah, I was, grew up there and I, I loved it and I, uh, uh, I guess, well, I, I tested positive when I was H, when I was 20. Let's go back before that. Okay. So let, tell okay. us a little bit more about... Uh, growing up gay. Yeah, right? no, growing up, up in, in there, because, okay. uh, you know, I think I even, and don't don't take it wrong, of course, even the way that we express ourselves, you know, you've been going back and forth uh, to, to this place, and you were part of the theater group to the... You know, right there. So let's don't jump too fast yet. Okay. Tell right. us, tell us a little bit about living there. Okay. You my, know, uh, yeah. growing up. Today. How was a little yeah. bit of the life it, right there? Well, it was really pretty idyllic. I my uh, cousins. We had cousins that lived all around us, and we had woods behind our houses that would from our backyard through the woods and through the Kemp's backyard and through another set of woods and came right out on my cousin's backyard. And uh, my grandmother had ponies and, uh, you know, it was great. Swimming in the creek. Hmm. Yeah, it was. And then how did they know? How did you know? By the way, uh, we have to say hello. Hello, Jason! <laughs> Hey, Lori. <laughs> Everybody else right there. Um, how was it to be gay? I mean, like, how did you discover? How did you tell your family? Or what happened that that he came out? Or are you gay? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm gay. <laughs> I'm gay. I'm gay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I kind of always knew. And I think people always suspected about me at least looking back i you know i like in kindergarten i i, I spotted this other 
kid named Kevin King, who was the biggest queen in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, his carpet was right next to mine. I knew he was gay right off the bat. I had a gay aunt growing up. And so yeah. I kind of, you know, knew that. But it was still something that was, you know, it was kept secret. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it just led to this um, kind of fearfulness, this a little bit of being like uh, comfortable in like at school and things like that. But with my, with my brothers, with my sisters and all that, my cousins, I felt great. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, what about your parents? Uh, was that a moment that well, you have to tell them? Yeah, uh, I mean, when I was eight years old, I was publicly outed at the eight uh, years old. Yeah, at the Hilltop Family Restaurant Bar and Billiard Parlor. Wow. Yeah, I was uh, I was cruising this uh, this busboy who was like about fifteen. I I always did have a thing for older guys, and uh, so and uh, he I was staring at him and I was staring at, at him so hard he goes, "Man, your kid's weird." And my parents say, "Oh." we know we know and i'm like wow what do you mean you know i'm like and wow. so so he disappears into the bar and uh you know wow the situation's kind of there's this is actually the basis of my next uh film this this move this story and um so anyway so jump ahead a little bit the bus boy comes back in and he's standing like really sheepishly by the door and he's followed by this middle-aged pot-bellied, bespectacled, absolute queen. He had his pool stick in one hand and his hip in the other. And he says, uh, he took one look at me. He says, uh-huh, you're gay. And my, <laughs> my dad said, hey, you can't say that. And he says, oh, yes, I can. The American Psychiatric Association just declared there's nothing wrong <laughs> with being gay. I can say anything I want. And your son is gay. <laughs> And they all looked at me and it was like, then it just, it was this big blowout. And, oh, it's funny though. It's, it's uh, more to come for this story, but that's, that was, but they kind of, you know, they're Catholic, they're good Catholics. So they have, you know, amnesia <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, but my brother did. Yeah. Your brother did. Yeah. He was a um, also, you can see, guys, how important I think uh, I, I just wrote something about how important creativity creativity is in our coping skills, and this is something that we can uh, talk about it in another kinds of interviews. But I want to go with you now, precisely, you know, about the whole point of HIV. Um, when was the first time that you heard about this happening in our history? Uh, it wasn't, it was in 1984, eight, maybe eight, 85. That you started to hear that about it? That I started it. to hear about it. And I, we, we were in Iowa. Yeah, yeah. And matter of fact, it was at a, a party and then somebody said, did you get, you hear about this gay cancer? And I'm like, I got upset. I'm like, no, they're just wanting to deny us, stop us from having sex. And, uh, and my other friends said, oh yeah, I've heard about that. Mm. But that's just something that happens in, you know, to people in New York and, you know, and uh, like San Francisco. And, and uh, it was, it was scary. And I, you know, I, I was, I was very uh, social. And so, and I got kind of, I just thought, oh gosh, I better get tested and, and see when the test finally came out. That was 1987, I got tested. And it was G February of 1987, and uh, you know, nothing like nothing. There was no treatment at that time of any. But uh, so you were positive. Yeah, I tested positive at 20 years old, and uh, yeah, uh, and I I remember I was driving to my parents' house to tell them, and. Uh, I saw this hitchhiker on the side of the road and I thought to myself, oh, somebody else left out in the cold. And I, I pulled over and I, I saw that he had like, you know, he had this like really cute ass, but, I, but I was like, uh, I pulled over and, and I could see him in the rear view mirror running up to the car and 
he reaches the car and he opens the door and pokes in his head. His ass was cuter than his face. I'll just say <laughs> that. But anyway, so, you know, so he hops, <laughs> hops in. He's going to bumfuck Iowa somewhere. And I'm like, oh, I'll take you. I'm in no hurry to get home. So, and he gives it, you know, he says, you get high. I said, yeah, he sparks up a joint, gives it to me. I take a hit and I'm going to hand it back to him. And I see the, my saliva on the end of the joint. And, and I, so I like wiped it off real careful and I yeah. handed it to him and I could see my fear <laughs> reflected in his eyes back to me. Mm. And I thought, oh God, the, the, the two things I really, really love, and I'm really, really good at, I won't be able to do anymore, theater and sex. And, uh, and but that turned out not to be true. Here it is, I, I you know, I've done a lot of theater in San Francisco. I've, uh, and he has done a lot of sex, I think. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> sex, a lot of sex. Not so much as kind of slowing no, down yeah, a little yeah, bit lately. These days, yeah, yeah, these days, a lot of <laughs> slowing down. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but that is life. Um, I mean, it's always interesting also to know, um, you know, in my case as an immigrant, in the case of, you know, someone listening as a woman, in the case of someone listening in different ways, um, how did we feel and how is it again that we're still alive? Yeah. You growing up in that place and not knowing, gosh, I say that place, like if it was uh, the end of the world or something, but you, you grew up in a very different place again, that it wasn't a big city, it was not New York or San Francisco, and I'm sure the information was not much there. Mm -hmm. um, and you were talking about that there were not many treatments. So what but, uh, did you do? Well, there was, um... Well, I'll, I'll just I'll, let me say this other piece sure, about sure, when I, sure. I drops it. I drop this unrequited stranger off right at the Casey's convenience store, and I struck back out on the freeway headed home. And it was really, really dark, and I could, and foggy, and I couldn't see in front of me barely at all. And and I thought, oh no, I'm going to get in a wreck. Or and I thought about pulling over and stopping. And I thought, no, it's so foggy, another car will hit me. And uh, you know, or I'll run out of gas and I'll freeze to death. And then this uh, like feeling came over my, like a presence came over me. And the thought settled into my mind, if you just keep moving forward and you take it easy, you're gonna be okay. And I just equated that to the HIV and that. But in terms of what services were in, Des Moines, they, I think, rel I was part of one of the, I was part of the first, um, like, support group mm -hmm. in Des Moines that they had at this uh, Mercy Hospital, and, um, and there was a guy from, the used from, who was from Des Moines originally, but lived in San Francisco, he came back, and he was the, you know, the witty, absurd, absurd queen, and and I thought, oh, well, that's not my role. And then, <laughs> and, and there was, a, but it was, and then we kind of started, you know, those were people, they were sicker than, they were sick. Wow. And I wasn't. And so uh, I've started to buddy them, you mm. know, like go take them shopping, take them errands. And, um, but it was, it was hard because, you know, to, to be out about that. I wasn't too out in the beginning, although I, you know, remember writing letters to our, like my state senators to support HIV funding and stuff. Um, one of the questions that I guess I uh, ask all the time, and, um, and I have my own version of it, but I think it's very important that each one of us really um, say what we think about that, you know. How is it that you think you are alive and others are not? Well, the reason I think I didn't die a long time ago like other people who did is because I'm a procrastinator. And I was just gonna put that put that off. I just <laughs> can't couldn't get to it, you know, too busy. No, I 
<laughs> I think it, you know. Too easy to do I think one thing <laughs> is I, I, you know, I had a friend who um, was very into metaphysics, and he introduced me to Louise Hay, mm. which was all that was around. Yeah, right. And I, I, I don't know. Good genes, but having you know that attitude and not being as fearful about dying it 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 helped but i it must be also good genetics you know my father my grandfather's from europe maybe i don't know mm. but yeah oh, okay let's let's uh, put this question also in a different way because most of the times also we talk about that were aches and pains and and it is true uh believe me i i live with chronic pain etc cetera, etc cetera. but what do you think are your strengths Oh, well, I think it's uh, my humor. I think it's my resilience, I, um, creativity, optimism, gratitude. I think those are my strengths. And that I, you know, anything I've, most of my jobs that I've had, they've been in the uh, social services uh, field. So it's mm -hmm. really about trying to help other people. All right. Um, you know, um, there's so like a 300,000 area that we can talk about. But I think there was, and it happened to me also because I moved to San Francisco. Um, why did you move to San Francisco? And how was that, well, <laughs> that big step from where you were to moving here? <clears throat> Well, uh, I took a sailboat out of Iowa. <laughs> and that's, I met this guy in Iowa. That he lived in Iowa. And, but, and then he, but like he'd come there for like a month. And then the rest of the year, he'd go to his like little chalet he used to own in Aspen. And then he would sail around the world or, you know, yeah, yeah. the rest of the year. And I was like, and, you know, and uh, anyway, he, long story short, we're sitting there having drinks. He was saying, I was going to ask because I was saying, I'm unhappy. In the and, 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 and he said, I was going to say, why don't you come with me? And I'm like, I don't know. And I, and I, my friend Joe was with us. And that day I had seen a picture of him and his boyfriend walking down the a path in Rio de Janeiro and we were sitting on their pet mantle. I'm like, what do you think? You know, and he says, yeah, I go for it. And I'm like, okay, when are you leaving? He says, tomorrow morning. <laughs> and I'm like, oh God. Okay. So, you know, went home, whatever we, you know, I, I got up, I took my mother out and she was going through a divorce with my father at the time. And I said, I took her out to lunch and I said, ma, I'm, I'm sorry to, to leave, but I feel if I don't, I'm gonna die here. Yeah. And she looked across the table at me and said, I don't blame you, Joe. There's nothing but shit in this town anyway. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, she was going through a divorce, but you know, so my brothers and sisters were there to take care of her. So I felt okay. Mm -hmm. So, but then we went to Aspen and um, we were we were having very safe sex, this guy and I. Um, but I hadn't told him I was HIV positive. Mm. And I said, I'd like to have a test. I'd like us to get tested. Yeah. And uh, so we got tested. He was negative. I was positive. And he says, well, you know, I don't want, I don't want a friend. I'm looking for a, a lover to go with me. Where, what would you like to do? Would you like to go back to Des Moines? I'm like, no, I'm like, I want to go to San Francisco. And so the, the guy gave me a, bought me an Amtrak train ticket, to, gave me 200 bucks, and, and the rest was history. Mm. By the way, guys, uh, if you have any questions, we're going to have about 15 minutes at the end of the hour. Also, you can always uh, write comments, as Andrea did right here in our chat. Uh, once again, remember this, this is going, this is being recorded, and it will be recorded for future uh, viewings. Um, so by now you've been with HIV for how long, Justin? Well, since 1987, uh, 
January that I know of. So what is that? That's how many years is that? 20, 30, I lived in 30, Canada. 30, I lived in 30, 30, 32, 35 years, 35, 36, 30 what? <laughs> oh, she's, she's saying how 35. many years. Okay, okay. <laughs> Type it in there, would you? <laughs> yeah, someone can do that. Yeah, 30. Math what, was not my story. What has been your major, um, I mean, I know you also yeah. friend for a long time. Um, and I want to leave it up to you also, some of the things that you want to talk or not. Mm -hmm. uh, what has been your major difficulties uh, I, in life, but also part of our HIV journey? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, depression, that, that comes on, I think, with this uh, uh, a lot. And uh, substance use, I've been in and out of substance you know, use difficulties for a long time. But I've also had majority of, you know, the last 25 years I've been sober. And so with a few, some few relapses in there, but, you know, it's... Uh, and I, I, you know, there's always that resilience, that 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 wanting to come back, wanting for having that hope. That, um, but that's that's the biggest challenge I think is is depression and and probably substance uh, use. It's been problematic throughout my life. Yeah, I I think it has been very difficult. Um... In general, for our communities, but uh, for especially, I think, uh, uh, you know, for our HIV long term survivors or the first, we're the, <laughs> he still looks pretty good. And many of us, I like to think we still look pretty good, but we are the first generations growing older with HIV. Yeah. And, and this is reality. We are the first generations growing older with HIV. So, therefore, we're encountering now the fact of growing older right. and with that now when we go to the doctors many times they just tell you that oh you're just getting older um but the reality is also of course that we haven't even begun to talk about our mental health and you mentioned a little bit and i talk every day with many people about our mental health as long-term survivors Many agencies, many organizations don't even use the term or don't even want to use the term HIV long-term survivors for many reasons. Mm. Um, but um, I want to know, just passing now to now, excuse me, um, we know that at least in the Bay Area, also we have the housing issue that is super problematic. Mm in your personal case, living at this moment of life, I mean, we're still living, what would you consider that are still your main issues happening? Uh, yours and also, uh, if you don't mind, you yeah. work also? Uh, what is your job that you do right now? Yeah, I work uh, as a case manager at the Treatment Access Program in uh, San Francisco. So it's to you know help yeah. people who yeah, come in to get treatment. So we, he's also in touch with communities. So the question is personal and also what are the major issues that you see in communities in general? Well, there's this, of course, you know, there's the meth epidemic, which is just, you know, it's, it's done a lot to destroy and harm our community. And I, you know, and, um, you know, there are, yeah, I look on the streets and I see, you know, the, the people living on the streets and drug addicts and young kids and, and uh, that's heartbreaking. Um, and so, you know, I'm glad that for my job that makes, helps me feel a little bit better is that I can somehow try to be of help with that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's this, it seemed like when we were younger, right? There was like, you, you got it, you went out, you met people out, out and about in the bars or in person and you hooked up and it was, 
more about you kind of got to know them a little bit better, <laughs> right? <laughs> now it's kind of like, okay, order, hello. I'll take a hot blondie, you know, <laughs> extra sauce. Well, so, come on funny, over, you know. It's funny that delivery. you say, someone told me that it was like delivering pizza these yeah. days. Uh, because we also have to remember that, of course, now we have social media and we could just go like, uh, this is what I want. This is what I'm requesting for. And you're right. Uh, in many ways, things are not allowing us to be a little bit closer with these communities, not only because of the drug use, but also social media is an interesting thing. You literally can really request everything that you want and you're looking for. Uh, but then it doesn't allow you many yeah. times to communicate, right? So, and and I, and I also know there's a lot of reasons why people use drugs. There's reasons of course. why I use yeah, drugs, yeah. and you know, not everybody's an addict. And you know, I I, I want to just emphasize that too. It's not like I'm totally anti-drug or anything. But also judgmental because yeah, exactly yeah, right? many times we really need to find out. When we see all these people on the streets, it's very easy sometimes just to say, oh, my God, like I remember when, when was it? I'm sorry. What was the name of the the president's leader? They say, just say, just oh, say, just no. say no, Reagan, Nancy Reagan. Just, just say, say no. no. Like if it was that simple, yeah, yeah. it's like I'm not recognizing that an yeah. addiction is an addiction. Yeah. Uh, let's pass to something else because right now it's super important also, guys. And then, oh my God, like I want to talk to these people right here. Yes. Um, we started having, I mean, it seems like it's almost like one after another. I'm sure you heard now that polio is a new um, Polio is back, yeah, yeah. All years back, but first, you know, all the COVID 19, all the different variations. Uh, the legionaries disease was showing up in a few places right here. My doctor told me to also do the meningococcal vaccine because there were a few cases happening as well. Uh, and uh, of course, we cannot forget monkeypox, the MPX. Many people are trying to call it MPX now in order to eliminate also part of the stigma to it. And now polio. Yeah, because we don't want to offend, offend monkeys. So <laughs> the, don't call it monkeypox, call it mpox. <laughs> Shut up. So <laughs> I want to know, because people have asked me also a lot about that, um, what kind of triggers, what kind of moments have remind you a lot of what happened in the 80s and the 90s and what kind of differences what we have seen yeah. with the government or not seeing it etc you know well you know the, the whole i was less triggered by covid mm. in in that it was happening to everybody <laughs> you know and we weren't isolated and um you know it was across communities and across ages and across borders and, yeah and um uh, and, and gender, sexuality, the monkeypox was the kind of the weird one. And even though, I mean, I, I just read somebody died down in LA or something and, you know, and it, and it, oh, you know, I was watching uh, something on the news and this, one of the MAGA people, sheriffs or something yeah, yeah, yeah. was saying, uh, you know, wait, you know, and this monkeypox, we know who it's up. Who, what little small group that's affecting and you know and it's like oh it's like that again that yeah you know and it's all kind of that, that ugliness is it bubbling up and and that makes me uh frightened and angry but you know with the with the whole deal with the whole aids epidemic you know there was this post-traumatic growth that came out of that for our community, and uh, I think it, you know, helps us. I, I'm, I'm convinced that's why, in relatively short order, gay marriage became legal, is because we had that political, you know, machine or infrastructure in place that, that we had put in place for HIV that we were, you know, going full, you know, using full force as if our lives depended on it because it did. Yeah. Um, 
just your opinion, but uh, I mean, one of the things that we've been asked a few of us in media and everything after having, of course, just not long ago, 40 years, 40 years of the first cases of HIV AIDS. And um, of course, then in a matter of uh, two years or so, we had vaccines for COVID-19. Oh, yeah. Well, we still don't have the vaccine for HIV. And and we have, of course, many yeah. other things uh, happening, but also including even talking about mental health when it's been talked about long COVID. But many, the news or society or everything still don't recognize the mental health or living with long-term HIV. But it is being talked a lot already about long COVID, mental and physical. Um, what do you think about these things happening? I know it can be political, social, whatever, but just whatever you think about it. And because I'm sure even these elements influence your creativity right. and, and your life every right. day. Well, I think it's one, again, that it's affecting more people, the, the COVID. So they were at risk. So that's why they jumped on it. But of course, it's for the reason why there's not a, you know, vaccine for HIV. And there's, you know, because they're making a lot of money off these pills, that, you know, one pill a day that's keeping us alive. And I think, I think that has a lot to do with it. Many people think about these things. If uh, these theories are real or not real, of course, we don't know, but it's, it's, it's very, uh, sometimes like many people say, it's, it's, it's weird that in really, in a matter of two years, there were already like a 300 vaccines for COVID-19. I do want to mention one a small anecdote that happened to me that immediately took me to the 80s and the 90s when COVID started to appear. And I was in the bus, you know, with my mom. And it was, I don't know if you guys remember, but it was when they were not allowing the cruise ship to land, to land, land to, board. To, to board, I'm sorry, right here. In, in Auckland, I think mm -hmm. it was Auckland. And these people were talking on the bus. And this lady, I'm not lying to you, she literally said, how is it possible that they are allowing these people to land right there or to port or whatever you, I don't know the exact term, in Auckland, they should be taken to an island and keep uh. them there isolated and not bring them here to our land. Mm -hmm. And that immediately, immediately for me, that was my moment that it really triggered me and it really took me a lot to the 80s and the 90s because I remember very vividly how, uh, you know, they, of course, they hold not using the bathroom, they're not touching, they're not doing that, not everything, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and now, of course, happening again also mm -hmm. with monkeypox, with MPX. Um, sadly, there has been already many places, you know, talking about it, or the gay disease, mm -hmm. uh, or when we already know that is not even, um, you know, a, a just sexually transmitted yeah. disease. But that was for me, like, the trigger, the moment that really... Um, it took me to do, do those things. Can I ask you something? How, because I haven't read really everything that you, you know, I've been reading some things because he had allowed me to write, for me to write, to read. Um, how is it that all these elements that happened to you in your life of HIV, but also now all these different pandemics uh, have you written or have you, <clears throat> yeah. excuse me, or have you wrote something? Yeah, I mean, I back in the 90s, uh, I wrote a show called Positively Twisted, which was about <clears throat> growing up gay in Iowa and being a long-term survivor of HIV. Yeah. And that was uh, 
you know, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, that was fun. We did it at the Fringe Festival, took it back to my hometown in Iowa, mm. you know, kind of did a little bit of touring with it, but it was, mm. yeah. Yep. Well, I would love to talk to some of these people. I want to know from you before we <laughs> see what Andrea says. Uh, Lyndon, Lyndon, do I, can I, how do you pronounce it? Lyndon, Lyndon LaRouche. Yeah, he was so the guy that idea. tried to get people uh, in camps right? yeah. back then. Yep. Yeah. So before I, uh, I want to start talking to these peeps, um, what would you like to see happening for uh, the age? you know, for our communities. Um, I, I do know my take, but I want to hear it from you also. What would you like to happen? How would you like to see your life um, growing older with HIV? Mm -hmm. If living less eliminated with HIV, what would you like to see your life? How you would you like to see your life better? Okay, so, uh, I mean, I I know that uh, there are a lot of people who sometimes they, you know, they'll get isolated in the, having HIV. Maybe they're on disability. They can't afford to go out as much. They can't afford to do stuff like that. I, I've been fortunate for the majority of my life. I've been able to work and to be out and social. So I think anything that kind of, you know, addresses that need, there's like 50 plus that gets yeah. people out. There's like your, this group here mm. that connects people, you know, in, even online virtually. Yeah. But so they're not so alone because that's the, that's the thing that just saddens me what I don't want to, have happened to myself as a as a gay older gay person is to be you know that kind of forgotten that drifted off and I, I don't want to see that happen yeah. to other people <clears throat> in the aging LGB community so and I've often you know I've been thinking about going and getting a master's in social work and and if I did I think that population would be who I'd like to, to work with and maybe even kind of look for again opportunities to um, you know honor the honor the the a you know the experiences of aging people and yeah. and, and for younger you know to tie them together in the community because I think we tend to you know, in the gay community, one sad part is we tend to eat our young and bury our old before they're dead, you know? No, well, it is true. Let me tell you something, because I see that on the group constantly. I mean, come on, we need to learn to talk a little bit better to each other, uh, because you hear this from the older people saying sometimes, like, how is it happening to you with all the information and all the medicines and all the prep? How is that you're becoming HIV positive? Come on, it happens, period. And from the young people, also like many people don't even know our history anymore or what happened. Uh, so it is very important that we do more uh, intercommunication. Uh, before our Jason leave us, because I really, uh, I don't know if Jason's still there, but we have other people right here. I want you to please uh, tell everyone, because time keeps passing by, about uh, Palm Springs. Oh, Palm Springs, yes. So, or about the whole yeah. play, because uh, yeah. in that so, way. So, uh, this old tea room, the, the short film, it's like 28 minutes, and it's playing in Palm Springs on. Friday, September 16th at 2 5, no, 12 15 in the afternoon. And it's part of the uh, Palm Springs of Cinema Diverse LGBT Film Festival in Palm Springs. And it seems like uh, there's going to be other ways also to have access to the, uh, or not yet. Uh, yeah, there we're, we're, you know, I've gotten a couple offers on some things. Uh, Gay Binge TV has uh, made an offer to. Okay, so there might be another some, option. Yeah. What I can say is that it's really worth it. Uh, so I hope that you can see it. Um, 
in some of the things that we were talking about, again, we can extend it and have always two, three hours of conversation on one particular issue, um, you know, but, uh, but let's leave it there because yes, ageism still exists almost at every level. If anything, for good or for bad, sometimes I feel like ageism exists in this country even more than another ones in Mexico uh family is uh is like a for good or for bad sometimes is like a super important and it has its bad side too but uh, ageism but, but, um, but one thing I also find is that probably I don't think the the gay culture is gonna I, it's not gonna change and what really for me has to change is my attitude and my own values around aging and what that's like. And so that's kind of, that's really kind of what I'm working on this phase of my life, you know, is, is just valuing, yeah. other, you know. Yeah, but it's, really, it's not just sure. our community or you, it's, a, it's the whole fact again, if you go to a doctor, ageism is that without even checking you out, they tell you, oh, you're just getting older yeah, without right. even checking you out. So it is part of a regular ageism. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we have about uh, 15 more minutes and I really, we have a few uh, people right here that um, at least to have a little conversation. Sure. Um, so I'm gonna put you in the spot. I, well, I think you know Lori personally. Yes, I think Lori. I even met her oh, yes. Before. What? Lori is the executive producer uh, of this old TV room. <laughs> yeah. So, and neighbor and friend. <laughs> and neighbor and friend. So, Lori, why don't you say hello in the microphone and tell us, tell us a little bit about Mr. Joseph <laughs> Leonardi right here. Uh, if uh, uh, I'm asking you just to unmute and uh, tell us a little something about Mr. Joseph Leonardi. <laughs> I met Mr. Joseph at Waller Park, which is a public space at 9500 Laguna. I live at Mercy Housing, which is a senior housing program for LBGQT folks and, and families and other people of age and um, cultural background. And he and his little doggy companion, Sketchy, were walking and so we just started talking and it's been love ever since. It's been an interesting journey of brotherhood, of sisterhood, of creative of flow, of investment, of a really good kindred spirit with talent. And my question to Joseph is, when you when you get these ideas, do you talk into a, a uh, microphone, you write it shorthand, longhand, you type it. How do you process it? Um, I write uh, I write my ideas generally down longhand. Uh -huh. And once I'm, then once I'm, you know, I have enough of an idea that I want to go with, then I'll start typing it on the, on the laptop. I didn't know if you had talked sketchy to, um, Transcribe <laughs> to dictate to, or to uh, yeah, take shorthand, short paw. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Lori's also a wonderful artist. Oh, good. Yeah, I, I asked him to bring Sketchy. Sketchy is this amazing little puppy. Uh, that I don't know why he didn't bring him, but but I asked him to do that. Uh, I, I'm gonna ask us now something about that. How long did it took you to? really from A to Z to create uh, this, uh, this old hero? Well, once I decided I was gonna do it, because mm -hmm. I was, I was, I was, had been, again, it, years had been on my mind, but then I, and I realized, I just came to like, see, no, I couldn't fool myself. I said, the reason you're not writing this is because you're afraid it's not gonna be any good. Mm. And I, and, and that again, it, it kind of, I thought that pissed me off. I thought I am not gonna not do this because I'm afraid. And I didn't want my life to go by. Right on. And I'm gonna connect it now also, presently also with HIV. Um, 
I do live with chronic pain and for me that's like my barrier and I wish I can do something about it believe me to really stop it and I do the best that I can everything from meditation to painkillers of course and the rest of above during the whole process of creation and everything um, I haven't even asked you how is your health these days how you've been doing uh, are you doing any changes in medications, etc.? How yeah. is that going? Yeah, I've been taking the same medication for uh, quite a while now. The, the Gen Genvoia, it's a little less toxic on your liver, supposedly, or something, mm -hmm. or kidneys, or something. But uh, it's good, I, and I've been undetectable since I started taking medication. Yeah, and I'm going to add something that I think is very, very important. It's amazing how many people do think that now there's no side effects uh, with oh. any of these medications. Yeah. Uh, and it is very important to remind that even the latest medicines are still giving us side effects. You know, um, more people are dying of heart attacks and different issues. So those things are real. Yeah. Uh, just to let you know that, you know, it's, it's not it's not the perfect picture yet, but uh, we keep it going. I want to put on the spot um, Andrea for a moment right here because this is our preview. Just let's say just a little preview of uh, <laughs> of, of, of Friday because I'm going to be... Um, uh, what? Uh, let's just throw one question to Mr. Joseph Leonardi. Any question. I know you're also very creative. I know you're also uh, a very optimistic person in many different ways. And we were talking about coping skills and everything. Uh, so I, I really wish, honestly, that we were like this, just having a cup of tea or coffee or something. It will make a difference. But one day we will do that. Mm -hmm. Andrea. <laughs> yes. Hello. Uh, looks like Dianthus. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love... I, I, I was honing in on Lori's flowers. I'm a flower child, literally and figuratively. Love flowers and plants. Love your phone. Hi, I, I, oh, yeah. What was that? I yeah. love your phone in the background. It's over Oh, here. thank you. Yeah. That is, it's an antique restored um, French phone from the 1930s. Right. And it it's actually works. Work. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I haven't had it plugged in for a while, but it has an adapt. It it was um, adapted. Do you guys know the sig? Anyone know of the Signals catalog? I don't know if they're still going strong, but they had the coolest stuff in it, and that's where I got the phone. Okay. But, but but thank you. Was, was there anything in what yeah. you, uh, was talking? Because I know, of course, all of us we have a whole different story, but. Was there anything that you could uh, identify with? Or... It's just chill and we're hungry. Just... <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Go ahead. Um, there was, the better question is, what didn't I resonate to? <laughs> because I just uh, related to so much. I mean, even you, uh, Joseph, found out a month before I did, I was March of 1987. You were 20, I was 23. Um, you went to Louise Hay, I went to Hay Rides in West Hollywood. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you talk about social work and um, doing case management. I was a case manager. Um, you wanna get a master's in social work. I have a master's in marriage, family and child counseling. Um, I'm also a creative person. I also love film and um, my bachelor's is in art and I, I love writing and I love my dog who's making a lot of noise right now. Uh, and so it's like, what didn't I resonate with? Um, even sex, drugs and rock and roll. That was my thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I resonated with a lot of what you said. No, and I'm looking forward again to this Friday. And this is also, again, a little just uh, preview that this upcoming uh, Friday, uh, the 16th, the 16th, if I'm not wrong, uh, we will be having a long conversation. Uh, 
uh, we will have tea or a drink, but from far away from each other okay. because Andrea is located in, in which city are you, Andrea? I'm in Sherman Oaks in Los Angeles hey. and yeah, um, but yeah, I, have to, I have to, I have to, yay LA. Yay. Hello, Northern California. Actually, my husband and I met in LA, but we're both, both from Northern California originally. I was born in Sacramento and he was born in a, the hospital was in Burlingame, but his parents lived in San Jose. Uh, so we're um, Northern Californians I mean, that grew up here. Uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, I don't see why not your, your film will be going to LA soon. I hope so. Yeah. Talk to the LA people. <laughs> I want to see it so bad. I've submitted it to some. Okay. Because it is, honestly, I was so impressed with it anyway. Uh, but uh, but we will be seeing you Friday, Andrea. And, and I do Thank got no idea how much I'm looking forward to it. And uh, Me too. I looking to forward that. to seeing it. Yeah. Can, it, I, can I add one what, thing? Oh, please, please, knitting, please. Knitting, teak, knitting those... Uh, glory hole cozies or whatever um i i love needlework <laughs> I, I was a 3d art major and textiles was one of my things so that's a yeah needlework is is my jam as well <laughs> yeah also i will be putting joseph's information under the recording uh, i will share the recording and i will put his information in case if there is uh any question uh doug my beautiful doug i see you <laughs> <laughs> if you have any question, Mijo, uh, or any comment, uh, please, uh, this is the moment. Uh, if there is anything that you would like to add, because I know that you are also very far away from us, and this is California representing. What would you like to say, Doug? Anything in particular? We, we are all three uh, in about the same area. I'm 35 years. Um, I was, and and I, we have always considered myself in the first wave because that was the first wave on the East Coast. Yeah. Um, you had the first wave on the West Coast, but I was part of the first wave on the East Coast. Um, subsequently, I lost my partner. Long, not long after that. We have got to really talk more openly yeah. about the mental health of our aging community. I'm part of that. Yeah. We, we have to, because there, I, I do suffer from depression. I have all my life. Um, I'm learning to cope with it, but it's taken me 62 years to do that. Uh, we have to pay attention because we're, we're not only losing our elders, yeah. uh, people that have have paved the way for all the youngsters uh and i hate to sound like that but it's true um we don't tell our stories enough so nobody knows yeah. what we're going through um right now i'm struggling with something that i will talk to you about later jesus um and we'll we'll talk about that but i'd like to bring that up too because currently for any kind of help you have to be tied to an organization or a health department yes. in a city. I live on six wheels. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, my, me finding help is horrible. Luckily, I have mental health that is following me. Yeah. Um, and I still have my mental health provider that I had in Baltimore, Maryland. But we're not talking about the challenges. I know why I'm getting old. I too have chronic pain. Yeah. Uh, they, and they're, they're, you know, we have one side going, well, it's because of this, but it can't be because of your HIV. But, and I'm, I really don't care. We need to talk about how we're going to fix it because there are some days I can't get out of bed. Um, yeah. We don't talk about the mental health that attaches to that. Yeah. And it's where we start losing people when we're not talking openly enough about mental health um, and needlessly losing people. We, we are, we're still losing folks, but needlessly losing them because 
they didn't reach out or somebody else didn't say, hey, are you okay? Um, do you want to talk? Uh, and we're not doing, we're, we as a community are not doing a good enough job of that. Uh, not only the professionals, but we as a community aren't doing enough, uh, a good enough job at that. Um, yeah. Just, I, you know, people occasionally get up on that soapbox and, and they do like I do. They start screaming and yelling at people because you just don't understand why I can't have this service, but I can have this service. And why won't you pay for my medication? Because I don't necessarily live in your county, but that's where I usually stay when I'm not on the road. Uh, and the mental health piece of it comes in where people start worrying about tomorrow. And when that little bit of hope for tomorrow is gone, that's when we lose the person that was there. Yeah. Because yeah. No, no, you're terribly, uh, you're terribly right. That, that, and, and, we, and we'll talk like you say. Um, sadly, I think especially during these pandemics, uh, it really, these problems increase a lot, a mm -hmm. lot. Very much. Uh, I've been criticized, and, and I know you work for an agency, I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, I mean it, is, it is a well, lovely thing that he well, works for an agency. Well, and we what show I, up there every day. What I, and and this, he, yeah. he shows up exactly. But many agencies still are working half time or working from home and not mm -hmm. reaching out to many of the members of the commun our communities. But I think at this, this just a specific point, it is worth it to even discuss in one, one Zoom. And we will, I, I promise you that. Uh, so um, I want to also say hello and thank you to my mama. Yeah. Right there. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> right there. And uh, I, I know this is a, you know, a small group and sometimes this is a, a, a group that is going to be expanded because we're going to be sharing the recording. Uh, but uh, is there anything else that you would like to share, Miko, um, about your life or, or the play at this point? No, no, just that uh, I think, um, you know, they say, you know, trauma interrupts relations, can disturb relationships. And, and so the antidote for trauma uh, is connection. You know, I think it's that for drug addiction. I think it's that for, you yeah. know, it's connection. And like you were saying, uh, it's just, it, that's important. Yeah, when people ask me again, one of, one of those questions again, that well, how is that you are alive and other people know, all what I can say is that without so many people in my life, I will not be alive. I mean, I will not be here. Um, you know, so many people, even that they have died already. Um, I don't want to pick up the clinics now at this last no. moment of the of the Zoom. But uh, there was this guy, you know, that uh, he was one of my social workers on my life. And thanks, thanks to him, he really helped me arrange my life in a beautiful way for many of the things that I have, but now he's gone. He died of AIDS uh, a long time ago. Uh, so I don't want to. I don't want to end up with a sad moment. I just want to say, really, again, uh, thank you to Joseph. Thank you to all of you guys uh, for all the energy that you guys put out, and we'll talk. And I'm glad that all of us we are in communication. I love you, and I'm very expressive <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. So we'll be seeing each other soon. Anything else that anybody wants to say before we end up this afternoon? <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks. Have a good Thank afternoon. Thank you so much. And I appreciate see this. Seeing each other soon. Mm. Love you, love you, love you, love you. Thank you.